The thing I really didn't know was that I could build muscle. Look at a picture of me two years ago. 65-year-old Tony was about 40 pounds heavier and was unhappy. I've got this whole huge change in my stomach, you know, my core. And really? I'm 67. Isn't this the time you're starting to fall apart? No. Man, I've been asked this question a lot. Is it ever too late to get started? Is it ever too late to get into fantastic shape? Can you continue to build muscle and burn fat into your 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond? Well, guys, why are you asking me? I'm 25. What do I know? Well, hear me out. Even though I haven't lived through these decades of my life personally, I am very lucky to know a lot of people who have accomplished a lot of amazing things into their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s, believe it or not. Yeah, I recently had a 91-year-old fitness client who I worked with for several months, and he definitely made progress. And you definitely can too. Uh, No matter how old you are, as long as you're training appropriately, uh, you can get better. But what does that mean? training appropriately. How does one train into the later decades of their life? Well, today on the podcast, you'll find out because I'm talking to the one and only Mr. Tony Miola, which might not mean a lot to you yet, but definitely means a lot to me because Tony is an amazing dude. He is a 67-year-old fitness client of mine who is crushing it. And in the past two years alone, he has lost 40 pounds and then gone on to, with the with the help of yours truly, he's built a surprising amount of muscle. Like the dude has broad shoulders and bicep peaks like he's never had before in his life. And he's 67. I'm not lying. It's crazy. It even surprises me. So things have been a bit crazy lately. We've both been busy and Tony and I have been chatting for weeks now about just sitting down, having a cocktail together and doing a podcast. So here it is. It finally happened. Grab yourself a drink and join in on the fun Unless you don't drink, or if it's like 10 a.m. or something, um, you can grab a water or a coffee if you need to. This one is a doozy. For the structure of this conversation, I told my private Facebook group that I was going to have Tony on the show, and they asked me some questions. So in this episode, we answered listener questions, including the, why start now? Is it ever too late to get started? What is sustainable for training in the different decades of life? How do you balance leg work with the inevitability of weakening knees? How do you cope with physical conditions such as arthritis? And how have opportunities changed for gay men during your lifetime? And plenty more. So if you dig this episode and you still have other questions you'd like to ask Tony or myself, then join the private Facebook group. And here come the shameless plugs where you can learn all about that. And then after the shameless plugs, we'll get into the beaten potatoes of this podcast with the one and only Mr. Tony Miola. Tony, thank you so much for being on the show. Let's go. Hello there, my fellow human. I am Chase Barron, and you are listening to a fitness podcast for normal people who just want to be healthy while enjoying life. Before getting into today's show, you might want to explore the show notes below where you can find three very important links. One, you can sign up for my mailing list to receive short, infrequent emails from yours truly, where I share information and inspiration to help you hit your health goals. These will be the coolest emails in your inbox, guaranteed. Two, you can join my private Facebook group. This is a great place to keep the conversation going between episodes with a community of friendly, everyday fitness enthusiasts where I post almost daily, and so do they. Come join the party, say hello. We've got free drinks. And three, you can learn about supporting this show on Patreon, where for just $5 a month, you can receive exclusive perks like name recognition in the show notes of my latest episodes and invites to monthly Zoom chats with all of my Patreon peeps. All right, that's enough shameless plugging for now. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of today's episode. Let's cut to the chase. This is Fitness Forever Whatever. Tony Miola. Chase Baron Matthews. How are you doing, sir? There's a lot of stuff going on, but um, working out cheered me up today. Well, man, I, I appreciate you taking the time, though. I've been waiting so long to just sit down and, and share a cocktail with you. I know that we just get to do it digitally for now, but someday we'll make it happen in person. I'm very optimistic about that. I want to take that train. Yeah, that Pittsburgh trip will happen. Yeah, hey, cheers. What do you I oh, I got something fancy here. Whoa. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, this is uh cheers. This is, is my that a uh, orange. What is that? Okay, this is an apple actually. Oh, I got it. Mhm. It's fall, so um 
I had my fiance make me a a fall drink. It's it's like a mimosa, but with apple cider and apple. So oh, there's a like prosecco or champagne in it. Yeah, it's just champagne and apple cider. Sounds uh, good to me. Yeah, it's not bad. And then I, I my go to drink of choice though uh, between you and me, Tony, is just straight uh, neat whiskey. So I have yeah, some of that as a as a love. fail safe. Yeah, <laughs> my 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 cocktail is very simple. It's just a uh, whiskey in a glass. Well, this is tequila and seltzer and. Because I didn't have fresh lime, a shot of a little tiny, tiny bit of Rose's lime juice. Because Carrie drinks gimlets, vodka gimlets, which are a little lime juice, Rose's lime juice, which is sweetened, and vodka. It's the true gimlet, I think, is gin. But yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right. I I know the basics of a couple cocktails, but I'm I'm probably not as well versed as you. You seem to be a little bit of a connoisseur, right? Long time. Yeah, many years, many years. Yeah. Do you want to get into, uh, I guess, chat yeah, for the podcast? Yeah, I'm curious about these questions. I guess for people listening, you know, I put up on my Facebook group the other day that I was going to have a client on, a 67-year-old client who uh, is making a ton of progress, and his name is Tony Miola. And before I say anything else about you or drop these questions on you, what's a quick intro? You know, give me your, your quick stats. What do people need to know about you? In terms of uh, fitness, you know, fat kid, lost weight, found running. What a great way to control weight. Did a marathon. Started swimming when I was injured from training for a marathon. I then did triathlons. On my 39th birthday, I did my first triathlon. Then career-wise, I was a music major, and then I changed my major to theater, and I got a job in New York. So I'm a Broadway sound designer and that I'm a, a former fat kid triathlete marathoner how's that yeah. awesome well let's call that the intro then we'll introduce you as tony miola 67 year old fitness client who's making a ton of progress into his late 60s self-proclaimed former fat kid marathoner and broadway sound designer who in the wake of the pandemic has found some other means of staying busy which has been i guess training with me so um, I appreciate you working with me for what, how long has it been now going on to? Well, following you and then, then actually hiring you are two different things, but it's been two years. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, I think so. The first question uh, comes in from Tara Kennedy and it's, have you always been fit or is this something that's new for you? Uh, no, I haven't. I graduated from high school um, very overweight in my freshman year of college, I lost 88 pounds. I didn't do much training in high school. And in college, I lost weight and I kept it off. And then I discovered running and um, I got the bug. In 1983, I stood at the finish line of the New York City Marathon with my friend Greg, with whom I went to college. And Greg is also in the theater. And we, I was, I wept when I saw some of those people crossing the finish line i just wept it was you know i'm not talking about the elites i'm talking about the four five six hour marathoners and then i said i want some of that in the following year i volunteered um to i was at the front runners the gay running club has the mile 24 water stop and i did that which was fun and then in 1985 i ran it four hours 30 minutes and 12 seconds Wow. So marathoning is your entry point into all of fitness, I guess. Or I guess I guess running in general. Just running, just running. Yeah. I, my first race I ran in the park it was so exciting, you know, four miles or and then a then a 10K. It just was the greatest. You know, I'm kind of connecting the dots here though, because you said you initially lost weight through running. And has it always been tied to races though? Have you always been No, 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 no. I didn't lose weight because of running. I lost weight because of dieting. And then I discovered I wanted to do something. And I had these Adidas shoes with three stripes on the side. And in Ithaca, where I was in college, I just would go out and run. I don't didn't even know how long or, you know, whatever. But then when I got to New York and I started running more and I had friends that were runners. And I really, you know, I mean, I really liked the feeling of running. And then what, what races became were goals, really. Do you know, you set a goal, you say, I'm going to run this 10K and I want to do it at this time. So, you, you, you know, go for that way. Marathon's different because marathon is 
first of all, your body is different every day. And there are days when it doesn't want to run a marathon. And there are days when it does. And well, days when it wants to a little bit more than the other. <laughs> yeah. Days. Yeah. There are days when it doesn't want to. And there are days when it and really it, doesn't want to. <laughs> there it is. There it is. But so no, I would say it was more, uh, more goals. More than, goals. Than, but, so the races provided goals, though. So my question to you now is, would you have continued to pursue running without races? Yeah, I think so. I think I would still have done it without the races. All right. And then and, anyway, you can eat anything, you know, like when you're yeah. yes. in your 20s, 30s, 40s, a little into the 50s. You can basically eat what you want and run, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, I've heard that a lot from people that get into marathon running. Um, now, to reframe Tara's question a little bit, how new is the strength training side of the journey for you? I would say with you, it's the first time I was serious. I've had other trainers. When, you know, I used to go to a gym. It was in my building. and But I do the things I want to do regardless of that. I never worked on my legs in the gym because I was a runner and I had great legs. And I was so oriented that way of how I looked, not what was good for me. Yeah. You know, and now I'm doing all this stuff that's good for me, but there's this benefit of looking better that comes with it too. Yeah. This awesome thing happens when you, uh, when you pursue, usually when you pursue strength and health, you get aesthetics. But if you only pursue aesthetics, you might not walk away with health or strength. It's a delicate. Uh... <laughs> and, and when you pursue aesthetics, unless you're, a, I guess, a competitive bodybuilder or something like that, you are comparing yourself with other people most of the time. And we all know that that is not a good thing to do. No. I spent a very long life wishing that I had um, an ectomorphic body. Yeah. You know, which I don't. You know, I, I'm, I'm big boned, as my mother would have said, you know, and and I have a barrel like chest. That's not going to change. You know, I, I can make this better. But but, you know, the thing. It was like a couple of years ago that I don't know what I was doing, but I was getting up off the floor going, oh, it's hard to get up off the floor, you mm -hmm. know, and I couldn't do it without using my hands. And now, you know, now I notice it. Do you know I'm on, I'm on the floor after uh, <laughs> stupid leg levers, leg levers, leg levers yeah. and I like sort of crawl over to mark my stuff on the computer. But I can stand up, you know, because I have strength in parts of my legs that I didn't have before. You might get the award, Tony Miola, for most improved squatter. Yeah, you were not squatting when we met Good each squat. other. Couldn't do it. And now you're goblet squatting with weights in your hands and, you know, doing all yeah, these funky when, variations that I have. When I was on the ship and had the gym for the first time in August, I kept going over and getting a bigger weight. And I'm going, wow, I can squat with a 50 pound weight. Do you know? Really? That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. So you've, you've done a lot in these in this past year even. Um, so here's a, here's a question from Stefan. He said it's, you know, it's never too late to start something new, but why start strength training now? I think for me anyway, in, in my sixties, uh, you start noticing things that you, I didn't never notice before little things that don't work so well or things that heal more slowly or, um, exercises that you used to do that you can't do. And like, there's that, but you know, I also, for when COVID closed all the theaters, I went to a dark place because I lost all my income. I've saved enough that it took me a while to realize that I'd be okay. You know, I, I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to go to the grocery store. And I thought, well, get on the treadmill. So I got on the treadmill and I started getting on the treadmill pretty much daily. And then I looked around and there's weights on the floor and I started saying, oh yeah, I should do that. And that's what, that was a catalyst, really. I knew that if I continued to grieve or, or bemoan the fact that this thing has hopefully temporarily killed my livelihood, I, I would have been in a really bad place if I hadn't found this exercise. 
And it, it's really from that because I have to say it's always saved me. And I, and I, I knew that if I got back to some routine that I would feel good about myself. And, and, you know, we haven't gone into all that. I've talked to you about it, but a few years ago, I was misdiagnosed by my doctor and, uh, and he told me I had Epstein-Barr syndrome, which is, for those who don't know, it's mononucleosis when you're older. I didn't have it eventually. Four months, five months later, I, did, I went to another doctor and he changed my blood pressure medication. And in two days, I felt like myself again. And during that time, I couldn't do anything. And when I say couldn't do anything, there were days that I couldn't get up and write a check. For those of you who don't know, checks are money. Things that, <laughs> yeah, Tony taught me what checks are. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, just, you know, sleep 12 hours, get up, have breakfast, get on the couch with a book and fall asleep. That kind of, he was killing me with low blood with blood pressure medication so that i gained a lot of weight and uh, i just didn't want to be back there Uh, you know one you know in that one day i started realizing that if i didn't do something i was going to be um as unhappy as i had been when i was overweight Mm -hmm. and like you said there's something about the routine too where just even just doing it even if it's the beginning of it just having the routine in place just feels good you know, there's something about deliberately choosing your pain that I think uh, is very rewarding because you have the you have the choice of pain, oh, yeah. yeah, the delayed that's, pain that's, that's, of doing nothing, right? right? Um, or you know, when you're the when you're the ringleader and you're you know, it's kind of what I've seen in my own self when you say this is the pain I choose, the workout pain, and it does kind of the workouts suck sometimes, but getting through them. Um, it's definitely much more rewarding than that other kind of pain that is the delayed, uh, you know, my body doesn't work that well anymore. I've gained a little too much weight. Um, yeah, I totally resonate with that I'm from a much different perspective. But now how old were you when you got misdiagnosed? 90, yeah, it was June, 2018. And that it was November, 2018 that I went to see a specialist, a sleep specialist. Was- but that there's a testament to doctors though. I mean, the the quality control is tough. I mean, the right doctor at the right time can change your life in the best way possible, but the wrong doctor, wrong time. Well, this doctor I've been with for 39 years. Yeah. So you, you, you put a bunch of trust in somebody and you think, you know, he's, well, he's got to be right. Trust yourself. If you feel inside that something might be wrong, something probably is wrong. Mm. And if you tr- learn to trust those feelings. It's easier said than done to trust yourself. Absolutely. Even to know who you are, to know what what you really want and what is just society telling you what you want, you know? And it's difficult to realize that what you're doing is what you want. And if you want to change what you're doing, then you have to change. Because if you're sitting on the couch all day doing nothing, you want to do that. You can say you want to be, you know, running marathons or, or, you know, participating in body competitions. But you know, if you're not doing it, you don't want that. You got to overcome that stuff that keeps you from your real desires. Yeah. I I don't know who said it, but it's, uh, if if you want to know what your true values are, don't look at, don't ask yourself, just look at the past week. What'd you do? Um, cause that's what you really value. You know, if you say, you know, you value like even to pull it to an outside metaphor, like say you value uh, anti, you know, the, the the quality of the earth and like you're all into anti-pollution, but then you spend your week like drinking water bottle out, you know, drinking water bottles and throwing them away. Like, yeah, everyone says they value certain things like their health, but then they don't reflect that in their actions. So until you start actually doing it, you know, you'll do all these mental gymnastics, but you won't be really uh, living a, a life that's aligned with what you want. Well, I guess, what, like you said, what you really want is to be sitting on the couch being passive and that's, that's okay. But if you're not happy, you need to change your desires, I think. Something needs to change. Um, so speaking of change, here's a good question from, uh, Ravi who, I, I don't know if you really listen to much of the podcast, but ravi has been on it twice. He's lost a ton of weight. Uh, him and his brother, they've just taken up walking and, you know, watching what they eat and, and strength training, of course. Um, and they've been really, really successful. Ravi says, what do you feel is sustainable at training in different 
decades of your life. And I know like this is a can of worms. This You could talk about this for hours, but if there's some general principles, how's it kind of changed by the decades? I, you know, I can't do that by the decades. I just can't because I can't define the thirties and forties. I can only define the periods mm-hmm. and how I felt. I was, I think, I don't know how old Robbie is, but yeah, late twenties, I think. Right. I was going to say, I, I think Robbie, you're younger because you got to do it today. What's today? What do I feel like today? What are my goals? And I say goals, but what do I want to be doing two months from now? Is there a race I want to be doing? Is there, look, if I've been using, if I've been chest pressing and I want to hit the 200 mark or something, that's a goal. And, but it's, it's just not by decade, you know, yeah, your birthdays are. Yeah. And yeah, when you hit 50, you go, oh, 50 is actually fun. And then every birthday after that, it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> oh boy. Because everybody pays attention. Everybody, you know, happy. Oh, you're 50 years old. Blah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, <all>. The <laughs> end. <laughs> yeah, but that's birthday song. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a that's a tough question for me to answer because I don't. But no, I, said, I, I agree too. I mean, and looking at this from someone who obviously is in his 20s, but um, who works with people in every decade of their life, there's not, it's it's amazing. It's it's so much more about the baggage that someone brings into the decade for me. Like to know how to train someone who's in their 50s, it really depends on what that person's specific 20s, 30s, and 40s looked like. And even, you know, they can go through a lot of change, but the mental and physical momentum from all these previous decades plays a lot. Um, you know, you can find someone and find two people in their fifties. Um, and you can find someone who's, you know, ran tons of triathlons and maybe has experience with strength training, or you can find someone who's, you know, spent the better half of those five decades on a couch or behind a desk and not caring at all. Absolutely. So it's, it's totally person dependent. You know, and look, uh, there's this guy, I, I only know him online. It's funny because we don't live far away in New York from each other and not up here also he has a house near me up here and we've never met he just said he's been doing barefoot running for several years now and he just set his 5k best time bare feet and he's 56 so it's like you can do anything you want to do are you serious tony meal you think you can run a marathon that kind of attitude is not going to get you in a marathon. But when you go, well, wait, you know, I ran five miles and I did that five mile race. And that was hard, but I can see doing 10. Well, there's something too, for me um, personally, for this um, fat kid who went through hell in high school, especially gym class, to do triathlons and marathons. The pride that comes with, I can do this. How many of the people I graduated with can do this? I need to, uh, I'm, I'm going to rephrase this question from uh, Debbie Ford in the Facebook group. But she said, you know, she said, if your client is female, how have attitudes and opportunities changed for women during uh, your fitness career? But I'm going to reframe that to how have workout uh, attitudes and opportunities changed for gay men during your lifetime? I was coming out for real when, uh, and when I say for real, I mean to, Excuse me, everybody but my parents. Mm. When in um, the early 80s, guess what also happened then? HIV. HIV. Yep. I knew you were going there. And it kind of pushed me back in. But what really got me out was front runners because I needed a place to be gay that was, to me, um, productive in terms of it, it was a group that I could be a part of, that I was proud of. I didn't go to the bars. I didn't go to the baths. I didn't do all that. I actually did exercise with other gay men and women. I, of course, knew gay women before. I'm addressing the women woman part now. You know, I work in the theater. There's a lot of gay people. Um, but, but I made some really great friends. With, and I watched a lot of my women friends progress but we did triathlons together. We trained together. We, we'd go out and swim where you wouldn't swim just because we had to get a, a training in. And, and gosh, it was just, I don't know. I'm not answering. No, question, no, but I think but, there, there's value yeah. though in, in like saying if someone's in a, you know, maybe a marginalized community, 
find find where those people are uniting uh, and doing something productive too. Everyone was there to find people like them mm-hmm. and like them in our our group of of uh, queers and um, people that did what we did in terms of exercise. Yeah, those triathlon camp things were just just amazing to me. You don't often find. I don't know about younger people, but in, I used to call it old style gay in in the late seventies, there were a lot of gay men and older gay men who just didn't like gay women. You know, they just never, they never got together. And I never liked that because I thought, well, what's, huh? And in front runners, it was a really, you know, tight group. And and even though there were, I don't know, three or 400 of us then, you know, there were 30 people that, that held the group together and, and stuff. And, and I was a race director one year of the Gay Pride Run in 1993. And I just, it's just, I don't know the maybe it's cause we're all gay, but the men, women, male, female part kind of fades away and they just become people, you yeah. know, they're. It's community. You know, yeah. I, it's, and you, I mean, that's the thing about two front runners, uh, and even like theater, is that those are communities that, you know, from the outside looking in, most people in those communities don't bring a lot of prejudice e- into anything. You know, whether it's like gender, race, uh, anything. Right. I mean, it's it's almost right. like every person right. is like blank slate. Um, we're just gonna look at you as the quality of who you are, right. and move forward there. Right. And I I see that in theater and. And I mean, I imagine front runners. It's the way you describe it. It sounds like, it sounds like you would be a different person without front runners. You know, I, I needed it. Then people, you know, it was a different time, and and I needed a group that was um, positive that I could be a part of, and it sure helped me. That's awesome. Those are two great communities that you've that have formed. You know who you are. Now I know that you got to take off pretty soon. I have two questions I wanted to ask you though. Oh right. Yeah, well, you have company, company coming over. Well, so imagine who's cooking. It's all. Oh, okay. It's I figured. Perfect. I was like, Tony Miola is the chef. So uh, there's a low carb eggplant, fresh tomato, ricotta, mozzarella thing in the oven with a side of sauce. And I'm making a BLT salad, my own creation. I'm waiting on the cookbook, the Miola, the Miola low carb cookbook. Oh. I said, well, low carb is a different thing. That's another thing that got yeah. me the COVID times is cooking every day and discovering low carb things to do. But I, I got these two questions that I want to get to though, because um, they're they're pretty specific. And I'm sorry, I, I get off on tangents. Oh. <laughs> ask you, but I hope I hope your listeners don't. Um, oh, they're they're gonna be fine. I love it. They'll they'll love it as much as I do because you make the questions into stories which i think is way better than a q and a i think that people need narratives to really you know if you wanted an answer you could go to google this is about narrative right this i also came upstairs to the gym to do this because i knew if i was sitting with my husband nearby and he heard me there'd be chuckles every <laughs> now and then it would just inhibit what i said oh to yeah you. yeah no this is great thank you for getting away for a second so last two questions this one's from dave messer um he says, how do you balance the desire to do leg work, whether that's, you know, your weightlifting uh, or running or whatever you're doing with your legs, he says, um, with the inevitability of weakening knees as you age? That is a great question. And I'll tell you why, because I never had knee issues running until I was with a trainer who had me doing these step ups, you know, when you step up onto a weight mm-hmm. bench and step down. And after a couple of weeks, I started to, my knees hurt. I never had knee problems at all. So I stopped and then that knee stuff went away. But when we started and you remember, Chase, that I had clicked my left knee, I bought, you know, those things. Yeah. <laughs> the, the yep, cups, yep. You know, every time I did a squat, it, it I couldn't always do them because my knee it hurt my knee in this one part, but guess what? I don't have that anymore. And it doesn't make noise anymore. I don't know. I must've strengthened something that needed strengthening that I didn't have from running. 
and and now I do I can squat and it doesn't click and it doesn't hurt and I don't even think about it. In fact, I don't even wear those things anymore. And I can squat perfectly well. I'll show you if you want. Me to. <laughs> no, it's amazing how far the squats come. And look, I have biceps. Yeah, just, just say it. it. The biceps are there too. We got the lower and upper body working together. Um, so so now we regressed out of the squat. You know, I remember the, the first couple squats. Like you said, they they hurt a little bit. Did we do? I mean, we stepped back. We did lunges for a little bit. I mean, we did some other exercises to strengthen your leg. Although lunges never felt good either. We did no same yeah. thing. Yeah. So on that. So spot. it's it was a lot of training through pain um, and training in a limited range of motion too, right? Like your squat couldn't be super deep at first, so you just went where you could, right? Right. And then right. it just slowly gets right. deeper over time. You slowly gain comfortability down there, but ass on the grass. Yep. Yep. Ass to grass. It'll it gets there. For me, what I advise a lot of people to do, not being a physical therapist though, is that if the ex- if the workouts aren't causing the pain, then just keep progressing the workouts. If the pain's there before and it's the same pain after, then that pain is is irregardless of of the training. Typically, um, I don't know. Would you agree? Pain. Pain. If you, you, I think you need to learn if you're just learning what pain you can work through and what pain you have to stop from from what you have. Well, whatever. And um, because that's a big deal. But I, I knew when to stop when the squats hurt my knee. But then at some point, I progressed past that. And I think it's doing a lot of other things, like heel walks. Mm. What else? I, I think doing other stuff that, like, um, that doesn't even train, that you, where you don't bend your knees like that or put your weight on your knees. And I can't come up with anything right now, but other stuff helped it. And it wasn't until, you know, I just realized a few weeks ago, hey, my knee's not hurting, you know, but that everyone assumes that runners have problems with knees and I never did. And I don't know why, but a lot of people do. I have so many friends who had, you know, meniscus pairs and all that stuff. I see a lot of people who get problems from running, um, especially in the box gym. Um, you know, you see all sorts of walks of life of people that are mostly later in life, who decide to start running without hiring a running coach. Like they don't know how to run. And what people don't realize is that running isn't like an intuitive thing anymore. Like you don't know how to run. So what I, th- I see is just a lot of people run with really bad form and they start doing it late in life and that destroys their knees. But Tony, like you've had proper training and everything. Well, but, but my training, one of the first things they tell you is you run how you run. They can help you tr- with your arms and stuff, but your gait and your footfall, don't try to change what feels natural because that's what's natural for you. Really? You know, just get either, if you're going to run barefoot, start running barefoot and get your feet all, because that'll be the best thing for you in terms of feet. But if you're not going to do that, get really good running shoes and don't cheap out on your running shoes. Mm -hmm. And it won't be easy to find the ones that are great for you until you spend a lot of miles in them. Mm -hmm. All right. So one question from Risa Risa in the same line. Um, She says, I have OA in both hips, so osteoarthritis in both hips. Um, Do you have any physical conditions and how do you cope with them? What adjustments do you need to make with your cardio or strength training? You might have seen me (laughs) moving around a lot during this interview. It's I have an issue with the discs between C4 and C7 for which I've had two epidurals and next week in two weeks, I'm going to see a surgeon. And this is current and recent. This is current. I got to go ahead from the doctor who said, you can't hurt it more than it is. So just do what doesn't hurt. (laughs) You know, like I couldn't do windmills when I first start, when this first happened, because I couldn't raise my left arm up or turn my head, turn your head and raise your arm. Yeah. But now I can, but that's, I'm taking this stupid drug called Lyrica and I call it stupid because it makes you stupid. Yeah. And, but I'm trying to lighten up on that. But as I lighten up on that, it's the pain gets sharper. I have found though with this, and this is me and this is this particular thing, you know, disc and nerve problems in my spine. I feel so much better after I work out going, you know, that pain, what, what do you work through? What you don't work through when I run, I don't run that much. I jog a bit. And a walk, it hurts this usually because moving up and down can hurt it, especially if I if I like go down a step and it, it'll all of a sudden trigger pain. But 
it will always feel better when I'm done. And part of that I'm sure is endorphins. And part of it is um, getting moving because the worst pain is in the morning usually after I've slept. So, but uh, other pains I've done, oh boy, hips. I thought I had a hip issue and I went to a thousand doctors until I went to this guy. <laughs> it was my psoas muscle. And I should have known because like in 1991, when I was training for my second marathon, I just overtrained. I just went overboard. And all of a sudden, that's when I started to swim. Be- all of a sudden, I could walk, but like there'd be a curb that high, and I lift up my left leg, and it would go ow. But it was my psoas muscle, and uh, this happened later in life too with my other side. But uh, geez, arthritis! I had surgery on my hand, and arthritis. Um, it, you know, that's a uh, poof. It's not something you can do a whole lot about often without cutting. But in terms of sports, in terms of training, if you can get through it do it because it'll make you feel better, but make sure the doctor says it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're older. And I assume if you yeah. have arthritis, you're a little older at least. Mm-hmm. And, and um, like you said, do the stuff that's okay. And that's where like you having these different passions and being able to uh, do more swimming than running for a period of time. That's where that really comes in handy. Be resilient and do what you can. I love that about your story. It's so many decades of, you know, just switching things up slightly and, and always doing what you can do. And that's even what I've known from training with you for the past year. And what you want to do. And what you want. I know now, like Saturday when I was exhausted from stress from all over the place, from moving house, from ill husbands, from everything. I knew that if I worked out, I'd feel better. This is running. It's the same thing with running. Oh, I've got to get out for a run because I know I will feel better afterward. I know it. Well, in my workout, it was hard. It was hard. It was hard until I got to the wood chops, which I just love. And I think I love them because it's sort of an endurance thing. And, and, and by the time I got there, it, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy workout, but it was pleasurable. And then when I was done and took a shower, I just felt so much better so much better i love it you got to find and that's the thing you got to find the work that's worth it it's got to be work and the work has to be worth it and and there there you feel that immense you know that immense payoff so i know you gotta you gotta roll out soon uh yeah i want to say something okay okay I, take I it away say what a pleasure it is working with you and one of the great pleasures is your curiosity you're a very intelligent man and I know that from your curiosity, you want to know so much and that benefits me, which I really appreciate. And I get a little teary, but (laughs) but I really mean that. And I've really benefited from working with you. Hey, likewise, Tony. I uh... your eyes are getting red. You have Italian food too. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Look at us, two Italians. Uh, yeah. (laughs) Italian and a drink. (laughs) And a drink. That's that's all it takes. And then the water starts flowing. No, no, it's been it's been serious. I appreciate that so much too cuz I learn I learn so much from every person I work with. Like I wish and I know from client confidentiality I can't, but I wish that I could take you all and put you on like one call together or like get some people to sign on cuz you would be amazed how many walks of life I get to hear from. And everyone's so different, but everything that everyone struggles with is remarkably similar. Um, you know, the battles, you know, the dramas of life, they wear different, you know, it's like different theater productions, but um, a lot of theater productions tell a very similar story at the center. Um, and that's kind of what working with different oh, people yeah. is like, you're right? It's it's a lot of us go through these same, the same kind of tragedy. And We're anyway, the underdogs who triumph in the end, for most of us. Yeah, and that's you, underdog, and and um, you know, underdog into your sixties. Even I mean, you've you've got a lot of success on Broadway, and and but even now, you continue to. I think you continue to get better every year, and it's it's a testament of, you know, uh, it's like if p- people don't give up. I mean, you've done so much just through believing that you can be better. Like, can I ask one more selfish question? Yeah, it's a, it's our neighbor coming for dinner. It's you know, it's it's fine. Okay. If, if Carrie has to entertain him for a little bit, that's fine. Okay. One selfish question. What would 65 year old Tony, you know, did he expect 67 year old Tony to be where he is now? You know, what if you two met? And I'm just, no. you, 
No. No. 65-year-old Tony was about 40 pounds heavier and um, was unhappy. And I always knew that what I wanted, what I liked, which is a big difference, was exercising because exercising not only made me happy, it made me look better and hence made me feel better. And I eventually got to it. There will be periods for those of you who aren't in your 60s, there will be periods that you just can't do it or don't want to do it. And recognize those as this is this is a break period. This is a and take it. And you don't have to gain 40 pounds, but take it and realize it. Take a week off from working out, as Chase would say. The the thing. I really didn't know was that I could build muscle and look, my shoulders are square. They weren't, look at a picture of me two years ago. My shoulders weren't square. My, my, I didn't have this and, and I'm not going to take my shirt off, but I've got this whole huge change in my, my, my stomach, my, you know, my core and that really, I'm 67. Isn't this the time you're starting to fall apart? No. (laughs) My friend Jack turned 85 today. And though he can't run anymore, he gets out there and walks four miles every day. After he walks the dog. Plus, he's got a zillion grandkids that keep him busy. And and he's an inspiration to me. Um, I hope I can do that when I'm 85. You just got to keep moving. That's the thing. I, I, I look at, you know, my grandpa who just turned 80 and he golfs, he cut, he's cutting back on golfing. He only golfs, I think four times a week now. It used to be, used to be six, but you know, he's in such great shape and it's, um, you know, a lot of people decide to, well, I don't know if they decide, uh, they, they don't make the decision to continue to push the ball forward. Um, and, and seeing you do that is is so motivating to me. I have a few friends with whom I used to run, some of whom I walk with now. And anytime anybody says, oh, look at that person, they have, they're going so slowly. Oh, look at that person. Aren't those dorky running socks or or whatever. And our response, my group of friends is, they're out here. They're out here. They're out here doing it. They're not sitting at home. They're out here. So what? They're slow. So what? They're fast. So what? They have a funny gait. So what? They have funny clothes. They're out here. That's all. Just get out. You know, I used to say, get out of the car. Don't just drive to the park. Get out of the car and experience the park. You know, just get out of the car. I don't live in a car world in New York City anymore, but, but up here, but but get out of the car, get out there. Just get out there and look. You don't have to stay. Get out there and look and see if you like it. I like this. I like where I am right now. I like doing all this stuff. I'm thrilled that, oh, my neighbor just arrived. I, I'm thrilled that um, it's so cool that you give me exercise depending where I am yeah <laughs> it's like okay oh nope i'm not going to be there today we got to use the bands oh right, well i got dumbbells today yeah there's a bench <laughs> oh that's that's my catchphrase though because i have this big sheet with all my clients names and a couple notes from our last meeting and under yours since we've met it's always just kind of said where in the world is tony miola and then i just update it you know because you're on the move but uh what you just said is so true though and i tell this to everyone that's showing up to, the, to go to the gym too is if anyone cares what you look like, then you don't care what they have to say. Like those are the people that you don't care about. This is a podcast, right? I'm putting up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just audio. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. You give them the finger. I mean, that's it. If they, if they care what you look like, then you need to not care about them. They don't deserve it. That's right. Well, Tony, man, thank you so much for doing this. It feels like it wasn't enough though. Cause you know what? I want to hear a little bit more about you. I know a bit about you, but sometime we're going to sit down and it's going to go this way okay and i'll have some questions for you 
Let's turn the tables. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh, and guess what? After telling, it, we, it, we went to friends for dinner last night, and they hadn't seen me in a really long time, which is great because they go, "Whoa, you love, <laughs> love that, you love know, that." You know? And I had to yeah. wear a collar, so I couldn't wear a t-shirt and really show them, you know, everything. But, but um, I was explaining to this one guy how you have helped me look so much better, and and I and I went into some detail about it. And and my husband was there listening. And today we're in this move, you know, we're packing, we're doing all this stuff. And he said to me, you know what? I'm thinking that maybe seeing if Chase has room for another client. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Right? Yeah, right? yeah. Well, he he sees you probably using your Romanian deadlift skills to get those boxes up and with perfect yeah, form. He heard me describing it to somebody else, which is different, you know. What yeah. I mean? Oh yeah, so. that's amazing. Well, the the inbox is open. <laughs> I gotta go. I, I really gotta go. Uh, yeah, get out of here. Go go ahead, Tony. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. So I'm gonna do what I do to my friends. Mwah. Mwah. I appreciate you. Mwah. It's Mwah. always a pleasure. We'll talk soon. Take care, Bye, Tony. Tony. Bye. Hello again, human. Thanks for listening to Fitness Forever Whatever, a podcast for normal people who just want to be healthy while enjoying life. If you got any value out of today's show, you can let me know by leaving a quick five-star rating and review in the iTunes store. Not only will your review validate my efforts and make me smile, but it will also make this show more visible on search engines so that more normal people can find this show and hopefully improve their lives because of it. I'll bet you can head over to the iTunes store now and do this in about 30 seconds or less. Timer starts now. And if you don't have iTunes, you can simply share today's episode with a friend. And if you don't have friends, well, I'm sorry to hear that. So maybe you're looking for a community of everyday fitness enthusiasts. Then you can join my private Fitness Forever Whatever Facebook group in the show notes below. This is a great place to keep the conversation going between episodes, to find actionable information and inspiration about health, and even to start an accountability thread so that others can celebrate your fitness successes with you. So come on down, join the party, say hello, we've got free drinks. And also down in the show notes below, you'll find a sign-up form for my mailing list, which is probably the coolest email list you'll ever be a part of, and you'll find information about my exclusive Patreon club, where for just $5 a month, you can support the show to receive exclusive perks like name recognition in the show notes of my latest episodes, and invites to monthly Zoom chats with all of my Patreon peeps. So whether or not you decide to support this show, I truly hope that it helps you with your workouts, your diet, your social life, your career, your whatever. My name is Chase Barron. I'm a normal dude, an office worker, a personal trainer, a dog dad, and a podcaster, and I'm here to help. This has been Fitness Forever Whatever. Thanks for listening. See you next time.